Church. Oh. Like I said, every week I'm just excited being here. Uh, honestly, just I'm just so thankful. You know, thank you God for always being there in our lives, Hallelujah. especially me. You know, I try my best, even though there's times where I fall flat on my face, I fail, I try to pick myself up, fall down again. But one thing I know for sure, He's always there and has my back. Hallelujah. Whether it's something big, or even all, all the small things that you know we take for granted. So let let us stand, show him his praise. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to bask in your presence today, to show you glory, to honor you and worship you and to show you how truly a good guard, God you are. In Jesus' name, amen.
Body bound. Body bound. 
You are so blessed to be in our presence. And you will be blessed going out. For the word is here. Amen. And the word is our Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The head. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory. Spirit, I will rise. 
Give me a song. 
is the Lord. He is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he was not. Then we were all still in our sins. But we thank God. Yeah, Lord. We thank God for the victory yeah. brought to us, oh God. Yeah. So, Father, this morning we come with an open heart. To give thanks, oh God, for what you have done for us, oh God. We say thank you. Yes, Lord. Oh Father, allow, help us to be overwhelmed this week, oh God. That Father, as we commemorate, as we remember that we were lost in sin, walking in darkness. While your enemy, you decided to come to humble yourself and give your life that we could find life Hallelujah. in you. Yes, Lord. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you for your great love. Now that you may help us to walk in your love, oh God. Yes, Lord. And this we do, Father, in Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. who's in need of an envelope, just simply raise your hands and one of the ushers will be more than happy to serve you with one. I'm going to start with the announcements. First one, Wednesday night, 6 p.m., midweek Bible study, followed immediately with intercessory worship. Come. That's all we can say is just come. You come, you're blessed. You don't come. You're going to fall short someplace because there's something that you'd hear that would definitely make an impact or help you make a decision somewhere down the line. Believe me, I used to be one of those ones who used to think, oh, I did the relationship seminar three times. Uh, how much more? Every time it's different. Every time it's expounded. Sometimes we don't even hear anything that's the same as what we've heard in the past. The whole thing is new. Come. Friday, this Friday is a special night. This Friday, we have at 6 p.m. our normal one hour towering at the mercy seat where we sit in the Lord's presence and we wait. We just wait on him. But this week, we're going to get to wait on him and then we're going to honor him immediately following at 7 o'clock with a good Friday service. Come. We're going to sing songs of praise. We're going to hear a word. It's going to prepare our hearts for Sunday, which will be, is Resurrection Sunday. Um, it's going to, you know, there always seems to be that little bit of a blank spot from Passover when we're all celebrating the, the Lord's sacrifice. Then we have Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday we have the resurrection. This will kind of fill the gap in between and keep us mindful of what we're celebrating. Come for that. If, you, if, you, if your reason for not coming on Fridays is you're working or whatever, if you're out in time, come for 7 o'clock. But for sure, if you can come at 6, you'll get your, your heart ready for what's going to take place at, at 7, okay? Um, this is the second Sunday of the month, so we pick up for um, our Brother's Keeper Fund, so keep, keep be mindful of that if you want to kind of earmark those, um, those offerings separately. I think, oh, okay, I'm just going to, just not that you guys need reminding, but I'm going to remind you anyway. Um, we're all celebrating the Lord's Supper. We're each doing it in our own homes. We're each trying to do it as close to 7 o'clock as we can so that we're kind of like-minded and we're kind of doing everything as a body about the same time. 
you have the books at home. If you don't have the book at home, you need to get a book. Read the Lord's Supper again. It's not a very long story. Uh, you have all the directions, instructions, what to do, how to prepare your meal. Don't wait to the last second. Get out there right now. The stores all have the lambs on sale because this year Passover um, for the Jewish faith is on the same day as we're celebrating. So now there's a bigger population purchasing those lambs, and we noticed there was no trying to talk them down. They're marked down already. Their stores are stocked. Go get one before you run out. Prepare your heart. Think about the preparations Christ had to do, preparing himself to do what he had to do. You know, we celebrate. We have, we have Super Bowl parties. We celebrate with the colors of the teams. We go crazy with all kinds of food. Let's, this, we, there's nothing, we have nothing to be more thankful for than what Christ did for us. Nothing. So let's make this at least as big as that. It should be bigger. So get your hearts right. Put, play the, the appropriate music, start listening to it. Um, just, you know, do whatever everything you have to do to, to know that if you were in Christ's place, looking down, you, he, you'd be pleased. Okay, and then I'm going to read um, from Joshua 1, 6 through 8. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only the strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Which is, you know, nobody here is a newbie to the word. We're all familiar with it. Pick it up, read it, do your one, you know, yearly Bible, whatever you need to do. Say in it as much as you can. It's easy now because we can have pastor during the week. We can put on that YouTube and just play it back to be reminded. The, this scripture that I just read, the Lord is asking us to forcefully, to be forcefully courageous. It takes courage to have the confidence necessary to obey God's word, to do things his way. He encourages us to meditate in his word continually, to verify that our thoughts, decisions, actions, even dreams are in accordance with all that is written. When we rightfully observe the word of God and live in obedience to it, our lives will continually prosper and we will be successful at whatever we put our hands to. And um, there's, well, there's one thing here, oh, um, about verifying the word. We, we are so blessed that we have a pastor that tells us not only to verify what we hear or what we read or what we see on the outside or you know, um, when we make a decision to make sure it's right. But we have a pastor who tells us, verify what I'm telling you. Verify what I'm sharing with you. Be sure. So we, I mean, how many, how many pastors do that? They, they, I don't want to judge any other pastors, but we have a pastor that is so focused on sharing just the truth that with confidence he can say, verify it knowing that we're not going to find anything contrary to what he's sharing with us. So if you have your tithes ready, let's just um, hold them up, present them to the Lord, and we'll pray over them. Dear Father God, we come before you once again on another Sunday, Lord, giving you thanks for your faithfulness, Father, to provide all that we need, Father God. And because we are so sure with an unwavering confidence that everything that we need will be provided for us this week, we can confidently and obediently give you what is rightfully yours, give you the small portion of what you blessed us with during the previous week, and to put it in the form of our tithe, and to have you, Father God, you put it to use in your kingdom where you see fit. We thank you, Father God. We love you, Father God. We are anxiously awaiting to celebrate with you on Thursday because we know that you'll be our, our guest of honor at each and every table that's participating in this week. And then again, Father God, to spend some quiet time with you on Friday to hear some words from our pastor sharing with us what Good Friday, why we even call it Good Friday, is all about. 
And then again, we look forward to, to next Sunday, the anniversary of your resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. She said, read it. You know why? God never says something the same way to you. And maybe just you, he might have a word for you. And as you open it, you re I'm reading it. I'm going to take my time and read it because I want to make sure that this week I give my time to really I want to grasp, I want to take hold of that great feeling that we should have, that he gave his life, that we can have life. So take your time and read it. Put aside some quiet time where you can spend time with the Lord and ask the Lord to help you, to help you to find, because that's why he said he gave us a week, give us four, actually four days to prepare before the resurrection, it was to think about who you can ask for forgiveness from, who you can forgive. It takes time. You know why? Because you're going to struggle. Anybody that tells me they don't struggle with letting go something, that is not true. We all struggle with it. But when we give time, we ask the Lord to help us. Help us. During the week, he might at night wake you, talk to you, encourage your heart to get up the next day. I can remember when I was separated and he asked me to write a letter back to the church. I couldn't. The first time he woke me, I was weeping. I got up, I started to pray at five in the morning. I, he woke me up, I came off my bed, I started to pray. And I knew what he was asking me. So I told him, okay. Went back to bed and when I woke up, all the reasoning, what was done to me, was so much. Didn't want to write it, I didn't write it. Came a second time, a few days later. Did the same thing. I, yes, Lord, I'm going to write the letter. Tears running down my face. Went back to bed, woke up. When I sit down to start thinking about writing it, all the re enemy brings back all the reasoning of what was done to you, the pain, the suffering you went through. And suddenly, I can't do this. I couldn't do it. Put it I, couldn't, I couldn't pick up the pen to write. Third time he came. 
And I felt broken to that. He's asked me to do something and I wasn't doing it. I was finding reasons. I was justifying my pain greater than forgiving. But it wasn't just forgiving the people. When you forgive somebody that did you wrong, you're letting yourself go. I was there on the floor and I was, as I, as I, I stopped praying, I got up at four in the morning and I started to write. I didn't go back to bed to wake up to find. I didn't give myself, I didn't give my flesh, give my mind, didn't give the enemy no chance to come again. I wrote my letter during those hours, put a stamp in it, put it in the mailbox, then I went back to bed. But I got it done. I know I set myself free. And sometimes we help people when we do that, for them to also then find the courage to do the same. To do the same. There was a time that you can spend with him, that you can find the courage to do it. But I want to open up this morning. Today is a special day. We call it um, Palm Sunday. Today actually was the, actually we celebrated exactly the same time as Ms. Depp told you with the Jews. Because today is the 10th of our month, but it's also the, actually the 10th of the Jewish first month. Yeah, because the Jewish calendar and our calendar are different. The way they count, we have 12 months exactly. They have 12 months plus 11 plus days. So every so many years, they add a 13th month to the year so they can catch up. Because why do they, God, they were told by God because how, do, how we measure our month is also by a lunar cycle and a solar cycle. So many days after it, we start counting our, the certain time. And uh, that's how we do to find also our Passover day. They call it Easter. It's not Easter, it's Passover. Easter is a name they invented. And um, our Lord's Supper, as we now call it, into the New Testament. And the Jews do the same. The only thing is, they have exact days for each month. So every time they're running over there, because what happens when they run over, their time, their, their Passover and celebrations shift so many days, and then suddenly it catches back up after they put a 13 month. Like ours is steady. The same time, the same time, the same time. Christmas is on the 25th. Well, their Hanukkah celebration is also on the 25th. But it shifts. And then it gets back to the same date. It, because of their running short every year, so many days. And then when they add a 13th month, it goes back to normal. And, um, and you'll find it. I wrote it. I wrote it. In, it's all inside a book. I wrote it in a book so we can understand why sometimes our Passover and theirs doesn't coincide. But we do, we keep up. It isn't to say, I need to know the exact day. It's the time we are separating to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are doing. And we're not doing it with a quick uh, cup or whatever. We are separating a time to say, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. We're going to start reading from Matthew 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near, to Jeru drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that might be fulfilled. It was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. 
So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid the clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their, their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches, branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude went before, and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. There are a whole lot of things we can speak about, but today I want to mention that he came in humility. He came in humility. Could he, creator of heaven and earth, would he have wanted the best carriage they had available, the finest horses, whatever he wanted, he could have had. But he was setting us an example of power. Everybody wants to be somebody to exalt them, recognize them, to do something. But he said, you know, you want to? Humble yourself. Humility is the one road of true power and exaltation. And that's how he came. He said, if you do this, you will be exalted. You will be recognized. It isn't trying to prove yourself. It's doing what is right, what is required of us. Humility, so we see it. And if we read here in the book of Philippians, in the book of Philippians chapter 2, if you look there in verse, verse 8, you'll see, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. But if you continue to read, therefore God also highly, therefore, because he humbled himself, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that's above all names. You see, humility makes the way for you to be recognized. It isn't the great things you go and do. It's doing what you know we was required to do. That is what God is asking of us. This today was the first day of the Lord's day, last days on the earth. It was the 10th day of the month, but it was a requirement made by God to separate the lamb. Because from the very beginning, when he saved the Israelites out of Egypt, he told them, this is what I want you to do. And I want you to keep this as a memorial forever. So there was not an end. Will there ever be an end? I don't think there will be an end even when we get to heaven. We will still be giving thanks. We will still be honoring him for what he's done. Go we'll back home. We are here because he gave his life. And we'll have that celebration. When he said, keep it forever, he meant it. And he ex described how they must do it. He said, first on the 10th day, you must separate the lamb and keep it until the fifth day in the evening where you will slaughter it and eat it before the next morning. And whatever left over, don't keep it, burn it. And so look at this. So that's why on the very 10th day, he had to separate himself. He was the Lamb of God. So he was outside of Jerusalem. He was in the, in the countryside in Galilee, in Bethsemane, he was traveling about ministering. But when came that day, he went, he had to go into Jerusalem and stay in Jerusalem for the next days until his crucifixion. That's what he did. So he was fulfilling the requirements 
of the Lamb of God, finally, because that Lamb that was going to be slaughtered, he was going to fulfill it. He gave his life that we may have life. In Hebrews 10, it says this, because they were sacrificing a lamb out of thanksgiving. There was actually, that wasn't on the same day, but they were also sacrificing in Yom Kippur because, see, they put different celebration the Jews had. All was going to be fulfilled in this one weekend. Every special celebration that the Jews had was going to be fulfilled in that one weekend. This one week. Everything. Because they had, they had to sacrifice a lamb every year, not to cover their sins, for their sins. I don't want to read you, but God wasn't pleased with the sacrifice of lambs. He didn't, he couldn't see it. He didn't want it. This is where I, I was always be overwhelmed with these words that were spoken in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 7. Chapter 10, verse 7 to 7, 4 to 7. For it is not possible that the blood and, of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will. This wasn't just words he spoke here in, he, in the book of Hebrew. This was words that was prophesied since in the book of Psalm. In the Psalms. That bulls and sacrifice he did not free, but a body he is preparing. So he fulfilled that prophecy that was given in the book of Psalms. That God wanted somebody to pay the price for sins and he couldn't find anyone. So he did it himself. Who has another God like that? There is none. There is no other God. Every other God looks to people to bow down and to serve them. To sacrifice their finest, their best, even their children, just to sacrifice. This our God allowed and became a sacrifice for us. He was the lamb that took away the sins of the world. In the book of John, John while John the Baptist was baptizing, In John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 25. And again the next day John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. In John 10, you will see again where these scriptures are being fulfilled. John 10, verse 18. No one takes it. No one takes his life. No one takes it from me. But I lay down of myself. I have power to lay down. And I have power to take it again. Why? It's based on a promise. He said, this command I received from my father. He said, if you lay your life down, you will not lose it, for you will take it up again. See, so he came trusting in the word of God, that God made promises to him, and that whatever he did, he will not lose his place, that he will pick it back up again. And so Jesus fulfilled all of these in the last days. Most of the prophecies concerning him, one of the biggest ones 
You know, from creation, everything, everything God did, he built our salvation into it. Whenever you see when he's in the building, he's creating the world and so on. If you look careful, you will notice salvation was built into everything he was doing. And then he, he met this one man. This man, so you know, you know God likes radical people, you know. If God likes people to sell out, don't be wild. We'll do things that nobody else. People say, be careful. Well, Abraham was a man. He wasn't a careful man. He would do radical. God would ask him to move from his family. He would just pack up and he would move where he was going. He didn't know. But he trusted God. That's the biggest thing. You know. He trusted God to bring him, knowing he's going to take him somewhere good. That's trust. To blindly cover your eyes, put your hands, your hand in someone's hand and say, I'm going to take you. You ever notice someone, close your eyes, I have a surprise for you. And we do. Why do we? We trust the person that told us to close our eyes. How we know when we open our eyes, it's going to be something good. We're not sure, right? It's built on what? The love that a person who's asking you to close your eyes is built on that love they have for you that they ask you, close your eyes, trust me. When you open it, I have something special for you. Isn't that what God asks us to do? To blindly follow him? He didn't ask us to ask him where you're going in. All he asks us to do, just believe. Follow me. Who oh, he wants to follow me shall pick up his cross daily. You see, he asks us to follow and not to ask questions. Because if you're going to follow somebody blindly, you're not going to ask you, where are you taking me? Because you what? You trust. The road that God asks us to take, we trust him. For we know that road is going to lead to what? To life. But we already live in eternal life. But he asked us to walk that narrow path. And to walk that narrow path, there was instructions given to us in that word that we can stay on that narrow path. For the world and the enemy wants us to depart from that path. He wants us not to be able to find it back. But thank God for his goodness. He knows to help us always. He's an awesome God. He's awesome. I want to read here where this man, Isaiah, you know, look at this man's son, Isaac. This man's son, he was a teenager. How, much, how many teenagers are submissive to their fathers? How many? How many teenagers are not willing to fight physically with their father? This man had a son. He wasn't a young man. He was old. Abraham was of high age. Okay? How old was he when Isaac was born? A hundred. Now the boy's a teenager. So he's a hundred plus years. That boy could have easily overpowered his father. The boy allowed himself to be bound by his father, knowing when his father picked, put him on that altar upon those wood, that he had become the sacrifice. So the boy had asked. The boy had asked, he said, Father, we have everything here for the sacrifice. Where's the lamb? Where is the lamb? Not knowing that he was walking for three days, and that was his last three days was going to be on this earth. And he willingly allowed his father, see the, see the power? 
Lord's father to bind him and put him on that altar knowing. And his father grabbed the knife. It was going. To, but before that happened, when he asked that question, I want to read that to you. Because he's going to speak a word. A word that's prophetic. A prophetic word. And I think that same day, whatever the when what moment, I can't tell you. God opened the eyes of Abraham and Abraham saw it on time. And he saw his Lord crucified on the cross for him. And Jesus said it. I asked him, how? He said, I know Abraham. I said, how can you know Abraham and you're only in your 30s? Abraham saw my day. His day is the day he was glorified. His day he was there. He came for that one day to be hung on that cross. Abraham saw, God opened Abraham's eyes and Abraham saw the space of time. And he saw his Lord crucified for his sins. That's a relationship. That's a relationship. And he said it, and here he said it, but I want to read this verse before you. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham, when he said a prophetic word, that's going, he doesn't know. Sometimes God have you speak words out of your mouth. Because he needs to establish it before it can be done. And he said these words. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. But that boy allowed himself to be bound and tied and put on that, that altar. And if Abraham grabbed that knife. And it wasn't going to be a moment of considering. No more doubts. And God knew. If he didn't stop him at this moment, the next second, the knife would have plunged into the boy. God does not take a life. He just wants to see the decision in Abraham's heart. That he was going, not, think, not saying, oh, I walk and then think, waited for him to say, well, you got this far, I believe you were going to do it. He waited. That's why for God to see it, our heart would when we say God knows our heart, it has to be something we were doing for God that God wanted us to do. So God, we grab, said, Abraham, stop. Do the child no harm. You see, now, listen to what God said. Now I know. It has nothing to do with the heart. It has to do with the action. Action. Speaks louder. Action establishes things. That's why God said, speak my word. Put my word into action. Don't say you love. Don't say you love. Show your love by what? By an action. Because you say you love, but maybe your own heart can be deceiving you. But when you prove your love, God didn't say, I love the world. He said it, right? But he proved it. He proved he loved the world by an action, by giving his life that we could find life. It was an action. It wasn't just saying, oh, I love you. No, he gave his life. He put it into action. In Exodus Chapter 12, the next book, I'm going to read to you the command that God gave to the Israelites, and that's where Jesus fulfilled it. He had to come on. He had to enter from where he is into the, to the house, into Jerusalem, because no prophet died but in Jerusalem. He had to come home to die. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month, shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it at twilight. You see? So on Sunday, because why? They were not supposed to work on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, they just keep their Sabbath. Christianity changed our Sabbath to be on Sunday with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all these things, so they decided to shift it from Saturday. And God said, that's okay, as long as you keep it holy. He did. So he said, that is separate. So Sunday, they took in the lamb. And on, when they counted it, the 14th day is our Thursday that we're going to keep our Lord's Supper that, that, and so on, from walking. He had to come out from walking among the nation and come to Jerusalem where he would remain for the next five. He will go out and pray. He will go into the garden of, the, of and, and spirit was, was right outside, right in, the, in Jerusalem itself, you can see, outside the wall. Another prophecy was fulfilled in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 13. Verse 31 to 35. On that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to him, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today, and tomorrow and the third day I shall be. He was prophesying. I'm casting out demons. Hallelujah. But when he died, he stripped, he stripped the enemy of all his power. And on the third day, he rose, perfected, head of the church, Lord of lords, king of kings. Hallelujah. Prophecy. He spoke a word, but people don't understand. So, because you know why? The Holy Spirit has to open the sittings. What is every word is going along? He was saying, just tell him, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to be perfected on the third day when they think so. The enemy, the enemy tried to, didn't know what was going on, you know. But everything that he knew Jesus had to do, he wanted to interrupt. He did not understand. He had no idea that death can bring forth life. How does death bring forth life? Isn't death supposed to be the end of life? He didn't have a clue that death can bring forth life. So all the way, but everything he tried to hinder. If Jesus, if he's going to do something for the Lord, he's going to try. So he put, he had Peter, when he said, when he said these words, Peter jumped up. Oh Lord, no, you're not going to read. I'm going to read it to you. Now you're going to read it, you read it for yourself. In the book of Luke, where was I? Uh, it was with Peter, right? In Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew steps in verse 21. And um, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. He has to, be, he has to separate himself on the 10th day. And suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside. He wasn't with the whole group. 
took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Come on. He came to give his life. But he turned and said to Peter, telling Peter, now he's not saying, the people use these words so literally, but it was he saying, you allow Satan to use you at this moment. So he didn't address, he didn't, though he looked at Peter, he didn't address actually Peter. He addressed, no, he said, it was behind the words that Peter was speaking. Because he knows a terrible thing. When, when you hear, like I, I can remember once, a little kid. <laughs> Go on, there we go. I needed to lean on it when I come to look in front of you. <laughs> this boy was unruly. Oh, he was trained to be very unruly. He was allowed as a young kid to be like that. And I saw an adult Christian, when the boy was being holy, tell the boy, Satan, get behind me. And their ignorance, she was addressing the boy. And he didn't do it once. So they couldn't handle the boy. So they came to me and asked me, it was many years ago, if I can speak to the boy. The boy came to me. The boy was so broken hearted. He started to believe he was the devil. This boy, because of ignorance, started to believe I'm the devil. Because of ignorance. So I told him, no, you're not. You're not the devil. And I had to explain to him that sometimes people misunderstand what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing. He wasn't telling Peter, you are the devil. He was telling who's behind. We all get influenced. Every one of us get influenced to say things we should not say. And we all know when we come to our senses, what drove us to say those things? You see? The enemy is behind driving us to say things that we know we shouldn't say. And sometimes then we get, we have to find the courage to do what we said. Because it's hard sometimes to acknowledge it's wrong. We all do. When you get angry, you want to tell someone you know something. But you hold yourself back knowing you should not. Whether in an hour's time, or days later, as you held on to your anger, and you find yourself still saying it. Who you knew was, in, was telling you to say it? The enemy. You know it was the enemy. Then how come we still do it? Then who's behind it? If the enemy was putting in your heart to say something that you know you should not say, who was telling you to say it? Your emotions, but who was using your emotions and your mind at that point. Who is interjecting into your mind these thoughts to do something that you knew was not right to do? And you find yourself doing it. Isn't it the same enemy? So Jesus Christ was not rebu rebuking Peter, but he's telling us, when we allow our emotions, and Peter became very emotional. He became very, because Jesus was his friend. Peter was even willing to say, I'm ready to go to my death along with you. He didn't know when it came face to face that his very emotions were going to stop him. His fear was going to stop him. But he wanted to. He said, Lord, I will never betray you. But I'm willing to go to my death along with you. He meant it, you know. What stops us many a times from doing what we know to do? Fear. Troubles. Then we don't do what we know we should have done. Suppose Abraham had allowed fear that he's going to kill his only son. That stopped him. The Bible says Abraham believed. What did he believe? He believed the promise that God gave him. 
He said, from this boy, I'm going to raise up kings. I'm going to give you a people that you won't be able to count. They'll be unnumberable like the sand on the seashore, be unnumberable like the stars in the sky. And now you're asking for me to give you him. You know what Ram said to himself? I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey you. But then you will have to raise him up. To give me children because that's your word. You gave me a promise. Look at the power this man believed God. He believed. It wasn't the not. It was the belief that he is, this boy is going to live. That's what you have to see what Abraham did. Abraham decided, you told me, you promised me from this boy, you're going to give me children that's unnumerable. You're going to raise up kings from him. So then in other words, you're going to give me, you're going to raise him from the dead. Do you know that's what's written in heaven? Who wants to see it? Let me see if I can find it. Let me see, I know I'm off track, but thank God. Praise the Lord. I know it's in Hebrews chapter 11, but I've got to find it. Uh, uh, yeah, 11, and say first eight. By faith, Abraham, can you all bring it up at the same time? Or too, too, too fast I'm going, right? But verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he received as an inheritance. Okay, okay. 17, this is it. Verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. This is what his conclusion was. Concluding that God was able to raise him up. Hallelujah. Come on. That's power. That's power. Power in the promise. You gave me a promise that by this boy, my seed shall be numbered. And he concluded, God is more than able to raise him up. Listen what he said. But David, listen, now he said, but he didn't kill him. No, once the, it's not the action, it's the decision that God looks at to. When he decided to take the boy's life and he grabbed that knife, it proved his decision was made. And this is what it says, it finalizes it. It says, that in, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. What did he do? He received him from the dead. God raised him. So in heaven is written, Abraham sacrificed his only son. Do you know Jesus Christ only came to fulfill one promise? The promise was to Abraham. The greatest promise. What did Abraham do? He had one son, right? And he offered his one son to God. You know what God did? God had one son. And he offered his son for Abraham. So the Bible says he came to fulfill the promise to Abraham, and so his what? Descendants. And when we believe, this is how we become the, the part of those descendants. That now, now that you believe, you have become the seed of Abraham. Yeah. And so inherit the promises. Yeah. So don't, when you go to a Jewish place and a man acting cheap, it's just your brother being cheap. Don't cuss him till you're cussing out your own brother. Don't say God has forgotten your brothers. He has not. He has not 
He will not. If it wasn't for the price the Jewish people paid for us to have that Bible, that Bible is written knowing they're going to disobey it and they're going to be slaughtered over and over and over to show us. Why was it written? It was an, their lives was of an example to us. So they paid a price to help us to understand what obedience or disobedience to God's word means. And God is not going to let that pass. Never. Because if he could have done that, what he do to me? I'm, I'm a rebellious son still. But his love for me goes beyond my rebellion. His love for you goes beyond your rebellion. How many times we know what we should do and we find a reason not to do it. Aren't we being rebellious? There is no reason not to do what you know is right. When you make it, you know in your heart you're not doing what is right, what God has asked you to do. You're finding a reason not to do it. Come on. You see, the devil is saying, he knew God made me a promise. He cannot do anything different than to keep his word. Raise him up from the dead to give me my children. That's power. That's heaven moving kind of faith. That's kind of heaven moving. If you have a promise, no matter where you are, what situation you find yourself in, if you have a promise, if God say, I am going to, I have healed you, no matter what situation, no matter if you come to the last moment, the last minutes of your life, he will either have to heal you or bring you back from the dead, which he's able to. Is he able? Yes. That's what Abraham said. He is, he is more than able. Yeah. He is more yeah. than able to raise him. Yeah. I'm going to kill him. But he is more than able to raise him up because he gave me a promise that by this boy, my seed will be numbered. Tell me that power. And we should have the same faith. Don't allow fear. You think he didn't have fear? Do you know what type of love you have for your child? The love you have for your child. Bishop, and he's walking with him for three days. In his heart, he's the only one know. He's the only one walking there and knew what God was asking him to do. Wasn't he heavy hearted? Every step he made, he knew he was getting closer to that mountain. He knew it was a step closer to taking his son's life. But he said, you know something? He also promised me. He, he's con what is he doing? He's fighting his fear by what? By the promise. I'm lying here, I'm dying. But he wrote that I was healed by his stripes. So when you remind yourself of the promise, you're counteracting what the devil wants to bring in your mind, that it's over. No, it's not over. He gave me a promise. And that's what Abraham did. Every step he took in fear, trying to grip his heart. No, he gave me a promise. And I know he's able to raise him back up because he knew what he had decided already to do. Come on. See the power God wants us to have in his word. Trust me. Trust me. Believe in me. You ask in the church, and we're not supposed to make it any fancy story. He's asking the church to believe in him. You know why? The enemy did not know. He had no clue. In the book of Corinthians, you can go there, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read there verse 7 and 8. 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which go ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the devil knew, if the devil only knew, I'm going to nail him to the cross. He stirred up the crowd, the very people Jesus helped for years. How many of them in that crowd he healed? And all screaming, crucify him. He stirred them up. He stirred up the religious leaders. Crucify him. If he had only known God master plan that he ordained that seed has to fall to the ground unless it falls to the ground and dies it shall not bring forth life he ordained the truth and he said that death will bring forth life hallelujah he would have never have incited the people to crucify him he incited the people to bring defeat to himself he incited his own defeat. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And look at the faith. Jesus had to have this faith in God's word, you know. Don't think he was, he was human. Had the same human feelings, same doubts, same fears. But he knew, he had, I have a promise. I have a promise. Nobody's taking it from me. So then how can they ever say the Jews killed him? The Jews did not kill him. He died for our sins. No man, no man, no devil killed him. No devil killed him. The devil, nobody killed him. He laid his life down. Come on. Take the picture out. But that was incites people. To, that's how people get incited all the time to carry anger inside of them. Instead of seeing, he decided to give his life that we may have life of his free will. You know, when you read in the book of Matthew, chapter 21 to 25, you know the Lord summarized everything that was going to happen from the cross to the end of days, we won't read it from that point of view. We won't read Matthew chapter 21 to 25. And you're going to see, he summarized everything that was going to happen from the cross to the end of days. He told everybody what's going to happen. It's a summary. The summary of what's going to happen after the cross to the very end. We entering, when entering Jerusalem, he made a statement to the religious because what the people was crying, screaming out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in that statement, he told them this, don't leave. He said this in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 9, Luke 19. That's why I will not allow a rock to cry out for me. Luke 19, verse 37. Then as, then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. The same, the same people who leading him in. Were those the next day crying out to crucify him? The same people cutting down branches. How the enemy can stir up their hearts. You ever saw somebody love you one day and because they get informed about something, hate you the next day. How the enemy can take away something from us because we hear something and we believe. That's what the religious people did. To start informing the people lies about him. 
and it started to believe it. Then it incited what it believed to stir the crowd up to crucify him. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I made up my mind a long time ago. I know I'll have a stone to cry out for me. Whether my voice croak or not, I want to be heard. I want to be crying out, blessed is he. And when they, they denied him to be their king, they denied also, that's the saying they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They took it away. You know, they said something one day and they annulled it the next day. He said, but well, they're going to come. When you shall see the Son of Man coming in all his glory, and you will cry out. He was telling the Jewish people this, the Israelite people, you will cry out. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this time, I'm going to say it and mean it. Hallelujah. Nobody is going to be able to take it away from them. Because the Bible says they're going to look upon him, the very man whom was pierced for their sins. Say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that's why. That's why, we sell, when it's, that's why we celebrate. We will celebrate. We will give thanks. And finally made a statement, not with words, by an example. An example that he's telling us. Do you want to be great? Everybody wants to be recognized. Everybody wants to be exalted. It's true, you know. We all want to be. Because growing up, so many times, parents... Teachers, people, people who call themselves your friends, and then sarc they have, you know, sometimes you know, people are going to say something sarcastic against you, just like that, and you feel it, and you don't know how to, you don't even know how to react. People say things to us that are cruel, that are mean. We want to, we want somebody to recognize us for our value. You know, every one of us has. A value. But God put us all like puzzles, and if one part of a puzzle is missing, how can you say the puzzle is complete? We all have a part. We all are important to the fullness of the body of Christ. Every part. Some people say, oh, I don't need my tonsils. And why did he put them there? You ever notice it? It's easy to say, yeah, you don't need them. Clip, 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 cut them out. Man, make some money. And your tonsils are gone. Mine was taken out. There was, nothing was wrong with them. But I was maybe too wild to even go and confirm. I was planning to confirm what they were saying. But then I got into situations. I didn't have time. And you see, again, every part of our human body is needed. Every part of us in the body of Christ is needed. You don't need to struggle. But each part carries a weight. And God wants to raise you up to carry the weight. But each part is so much needed. And that's what God said. Even if you think you don't have a good part, don't worry. I'm going to honor you double. So when you think you have a part that nobody is seeing you in the background doing something, you already have a promise. Do what you're doing. Do it with fullness of joy. You know why? You have a promise. What's the promise? He will forgive me double. So the part I'm playing, though I don't think it's important, I'm going to get double for it. So God is telling us, accept where he's placing us 
Oh, we are needed. Some of us, some people need, some people have that humility in them to accept those positions. Some of us can't. To take those positions in life and to live it out to fulfill the fullness of the body of Christ, each drawing from each other as we are tied together by the Holy Ghost, the love in our hearts. Tied together with the ligaments that is the Holy Spirit that pulls us and unites us. Now, is there going to be disagreements among us? Yes! But that's where the love was given. The Bible says, to, this is how the world is going to know that you are my disciples. That you what? Love one another. That means if we're going to make mistakes, I'm going to say something you don't like, or you might say something or do something I don't like. But love has no end. We love one another, we forgive one another, and if it cannot start here in the body of Christ, where in heaven's name will it start? If it can't start with us, who are filled with the Holy Ghost, with the love of God, where will it function? We should be, that's how we are tested. We are tested by we doing each other certain harms, unforgivable things to each other. But if we can still rise up and say, no matter what, I love you. I can remember, I remember a family member did me much harm. And they came to ask me to forgive them. It wasn't a little bit. It was over almost a lifetime. While I was saying, I said, let me share something with you. I will not allow what you have done to stop me from loving you. And I went on to prove it with an action. Come on. Why did I learn to do that when I was born? No. I learned to do it when I was born again. Filled with the Holy Ghost and filled with the love of God. I started to practice. I had to practice. And stop being, not being a cheap preacher. Practice what you say. Doctor, take your own medicine. In John chapter 13, did I read it? He said these words. He said these words, getting ready to go to the cross. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it in the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, this, he have confidence in the promise rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded him. So, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing, you do not understand now but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. We were washed. We were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We were washed and baptized. The first baptism we experienced was the baptism into the body of Jesus Christ. But we were washed by his blood. And it was just as he was symbolizing 
But what he was doing, he was symbolizing his good. The symbol wasn't just, it was many things he was showing. That one act he was doing there. He said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now Peter never said, Lord, Simon said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needed only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. You see, when we washed, what did he mean? Only our feet. You know, this all through the psalm, the Bible says, draw your feet back from doing wrong. It's our feet that takes us, takes us into wrong. So you say then, since your feet took you into the wrong path, then your feet need to be washed because you were washed. When you ask for forgiveness, it's actually cleansing your feet from leaving the narrow path of life and in them going into this world and doing things you should not have done. And when he asked, he said, I will wash you, but only your feet has become defiled because I have washed you in my blood. So he said this, that's why we have to be careful where we walk in life. Be careful. He said in, 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 the, in, in the Proverbs says, the righteous should be careful when they're choosing friends. Be careful how you choose your friends. For it will cause you to depart from righteousness. In the book of Proverbs tells you it. And go ahead and says. And he said, not all of you. Because Judas was not cleansed. What, how did he cleanse them before the blood? Come on, with the word. Was he, we are being washed every day. When we come to church and we hear the word of God, what are we being? We are being washed. We are being washed by the word of God. You see, so he's telling them, you're being washed continually. We are being washed. When we come to church, the word of God that we hear is washing our hearts away from how we used to think how we used to do things and how God wants us to yeah. do things. Because once you wash off that dirt, you see clearly what you're looking at. And he, where was I? Where was I? And he knew, he said, for he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his, his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you. You ask them a question. You call me teacher and Lord and say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher, I wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. And that's where the religious thing came was washing feet. Isn't that what it meant? You want to do it just a religious service. It's a plain, 100% a religious service. Because that's not what he's speaking about, having religion. God didn't ask us to practice religion. That's the very thing that causes heart pain, is religion. And this is what he says. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant. Now he's getting on to the point. Now he's going to say, clear out what he meant. Because who washes the feet of people when they come to the house? A servant. What is he saying when he washed their feet? I did not come, but to what? To serve. And as I have done this, so I want you to do. He served his disciples. He educated them. He provided for them. He did all these things. He said, even in the last day when we sit in heaven, when we all get into heaven, we're going to have a Lord's, we're going to have a supper. You know what he said he's going to do? He's going to gird himself. 
and serve us even in heaven. Now he's saying, this is what he's trying to say. But we, what happens we do? We take these things and create an, an, an act of what God wants us to do. An act of what he's presenting. You know, let's wash feet once a year. We do a you, We can do all of that. But what is more important than come to church and hear the word of God and be washed by the word of God than washing your feet as an act of religion? Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you, are you if you do them. You want to be great. Serve. It takes humility to want to serve. Look at verse 7. What am I doing? You do not understand. Now he told them. But you will notice once they got involved in the work, they will find out all we are called to do was to serve. They could not understand for the different reason. They were striving in their heart who was going to be greater. Thought he was going to be what? A national king and they're going to be all ministers, top ministers of government. Their understanding was yet darkened because they were looking for a natural kingdom. They were looking to be the highest officials in the land. So, and what was officials? All officials look to be, they want to be served. Every official of a land should serve us. The highest official in our land should be our greatest servant. Because he's supposed to make sure that any mistakes we make, he covers it. And make sure that all our needs are being met. He was put in office, everybody, Every government official, everybody that's working is put what? To serve. What do they call the true name of a police officer? Policeman? No. He, is supposed, he was called initially a peace officer. He was called to keep, try to keep the peace in a nation. Try to keep peace. Among people of the arguing and struggling. You see, so we forgot our place. So what happened? Every one of us now being educated like that, all of us want to come to a place in church and wherever we go, so somebody can serve us. We want to have the most important places to sit. We want to go and be recognized. He said, you don't understand this. Why, when do we come to understand it? As we grow in the Lord and realize the requirements of us. You know, before I go on, I forget. I, uh, um, are you here to, today and you don't have a place to go and you're by yourself and don't have a place to go for the, for the Lord's Supper this Thursday? Who is here and don't have a place to go on Thursday? Raise your hand. Jim, you have a place already? Jim, Mary, Mary says she has somewhere to go. You don't really say raise your hand. You raise your hand. I didn't, I didn't see your hand. Okay. Who, who, who wants to provide a place? Come on. You who? Yeah. All right. Mary. Anybody else? Jim. Come on. Okay. Who's going to take it? All right, make sure, make sure you all work it out. Uh, Jim, have a place that we can go and keep the Lord, celebrate. Do you know it's a, it's not just a celebration. Do you know it's an, or when we keep the Lord's Supper, the Bible refers to it as an offering unto the Lord. It's an offering. We are sacrificing our time to keep it as a memorial, as an offering, It's a sacrifice time of sacrifice we are giving to him 
as an offering unto the Lord. Hallelujah. So here he's concluding. In his last days on earth, he was telling the man, what you see me doing, this is what I want you to go and do. He said, Peter, Peter. He told Peter that, you know. He said, Peter, Peter, you're a man. Always want to make your decisions to go where you want to go. You're all very, you know. But are they going to come? Where are they going to lead you away? You're going to find out what servitude. Let me tell you, you don't know it. But they're going to come. Where are you going to find out? We all think we all think we are serving. Then come a day where we learn. You ever notice sometimes you think you know something and suddenly, like, wow, now I understand it. But don't worry. The understanding of what we're supposed to be comes to all of us in the right time how God wants us to be. All he wants us to do is take baby steps. One step in front. Do what is right. Do what you know is required. But the enemy is going to come after us. He's going to come after us to get take us out of the way. But you know something? We are not going to be out of the way. We are not getting out of the way. So he came, if he came to serve, so should we. He came riding on a colt, a poor man's means. And so he wants us also now to learn to serve. This is a day where we will remember we are prepared today. The day we prepare, you know, we prepare in our hearts. We are going to be rolling in. We are going to, Thursday is going to come. And I'll tell you this. Every light, every fire, every meal, wherever we are, we're going to light this place up. We're going to light it up. Every home that's keeping it is going to have a, a light in heaven. Heaven is going to see a light burning in our homes. We have said, come on. You can come on up. Let's close with a song of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh
come before you with thanksgiving, O oh God, that, Lord God, that you may have prepared our hearts to do what is right this week, O oh God. Yes, Lord. That we can meditate on what you have done. And while you were yet our, your enemy, you gave your life. You forgave us. You justified us. You found a reason to help us to declare us innocent and cleanse us by your precious blood. So, Father, help us, O oh God, to see things the way you see things. By your Spirit, help us, O oh God, to find the strength in you to do what is right. And therefore, Father, we give you thanks this day, O oh God. And this we do, Father, in Jesus' name. And let the church say, Amen. God bless you.